No break yet until after the next one. Now we're going to shift the gears from health from uh, retirement over to health care. I'd like to invite my panelists to come up. We've got John Young, SVP of Consumerism and Engagement at HSA Bank, moderating. We've got Paul Fronston from Ebri as our research director on the healthcare side. We've got Sabrina Davison from Global Benefits at Comcast, where she's the VP, and Jim Broski, senior client manager at Cigna. So again, like I mentioned at the beginning, what we've tried to do here is balance some really interesting insights and research-driven content. Paul will walk you through that, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit about pros and cons of different approaches employers are taking to try and help manage the ever-changing and ever-dynamic health care costs in the benefits world. So with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Let's see here. Get through the... There we are. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, before I introduce my distinguished panel, just a couple comments from, from my end. I'm John Young. I'm Senior Vice President of Consumerism and Engagement from HSA Bank. I've been in the consumer-driven healthcare field since uh, the very beginning. And I have to give you uh, some, I guess, preliminary thoughts before I turn it over to these great individuals and their, their messages today. There's, there's some things in employee benefits that remind me of prohibition. It started as a well-intentioned idea, you know, to curb violence, crime, and the other ills of the time. Uh, what it mostly did, unfortunately, was act as an incubator for the mafia. It was a good idea with unintended bad consequences. And speaking of drinking, what have weddings taught us? Well, the same thing as employee benefits. Open bar, cash bar, people behave differently. You become a better dancer at an open bar. <laughs> Financial incentives or the lack thereof makes a difference. So today, we're going to talk about research around employee behavior related to plan design and where people are in the plan. We're going to hear of an employer's journey, and we're also going to hear from a health plan on what they do to keep people engaged. It's going to be very exciting. I'm going to ask each of my, uh, my panelists to come up and, and present on their own here. Um, but first, just a, a, a small introduction. Just if you could broaden your, your self-introduction just before your presentation, that would be wonderful. Just uh, to my left, to your right, is Sabrina Davison. She is the Vice President of Global Benefits uh, for Comcast. How many of you have Comcast? I've been a long-term Comcast member. Yep, I see that hand. Hallelujah. That's awesome. Uh, she kind of incorporates the, the adage, you can take the guy or gal out of Texas, but you can't take the Texas out of the guy or gal. She was brought up in Texas, moved to Manhattan for 20 years, but is back in Texas. Uh, and uh, she has she, uh, got a, a very important job with Comcast in, in driving their benefits uh, program. Next to Sabrina is Jim Broski. He's a senior client manager with Cigna Healthcare. And uh, Jim's an avid fly fisher person and uh, is going to be, are you hitting it this weekend? Yes. yes, you are. And one thing that Jim and I have in common is we've both walked the Camino de Santiago. If you know about that, see us afterwards. And then finally, Dr. Paul Fronson. What can I say about Paul? You, he's an economist and he actually gets a few things right. But Paul is one of my favorite people in this industry. Um, he's also very interesting, a big sports fan. He actually touched the Stanley Cup of the 2018 uh, Washington Capitals uh, hockey team. He touched it. I said, Paul, did you kiss it? He said, no, I could have, but I didn't. I don't know about you, but if, I, if I'm around the Stanley Cup, I'm smooching that thing, right? Well, Paul is going to be up front, and uh, he is going to be talking uh, to us about some research that I think have implications for all of us in the health and benefits area. Paul, if you would come up. Thank you. 
Thanks, John. And just for the record, there were way too many people in line before me kissing the cop, <laughs> who, I, who I didn't know. <laughs> so um, I guess you asked us to introduce ourselves a little bit more. Uh, I direct the health research program at eBRI, and I'm going to share with you some of the research that we have in progress related to plan design and use of healthcare services. So uh, look for, I'm going to share with you two studies. So it's really two presentations. I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. You have the slides. Um, and look for, these, uh, look for these studies and publications uh, in the future. So the first study is related to HSA balances and use of healthcare services. I, I assume you're all familiar with, if not this exact slide, what's going on in the slide. The percentage of the population in high deductible health plans has been growing, whether it's a plan with or without an account. As of 2018, 46% of the privately insured population in a high deductible health plan, we're basically on the verge of 50%. Uh, keep in mind that the definition here of a high deductible health plan is a definition that goes with HSA eligible health plans, so $1,350 deductible for employee-only coverage. This doesn't include as high deductible health plan enrollees with deductibles of 1,000 or more, which has been uh, typically what we think of as a high deductible health plan. Uh, HSAs have only been around 15 years. It's, this is, a, I'd say, a relatively strong trend going from zero to 21% uh, or so in 15 years. High deductible health plans have been around forever, uh, though we've, it's only recently, maybe in the fi last 15, 20 years that we've been talking about them. I'll admit, some of you already know this, that 26 years ago when I was in graduate school, so 1992, or 27 years ago when I was in graduate school, I was on a health plan with a $1,200 deductible, uh, almost unheard of at the time. So these, these plans have been around for, for a while, strong trend towards them. And then there's also the accounts. We're now at the point, as of the end of last year, 25 million accounts, HSAs, in the US. So we've done a lot of research. Others have done research related to the impact of the plan, uh, the deductible, on use of services, and you can see all the different aspects that we've looked at and others have looked at. Uh, we've looked at plan choice. There's a lot of work done on HSAs, but nobody's really put the two together. And why would you want to put the two together? Well, we know what deductibles do. We know deductibles reduce use of services. We don't know what account balances do. I would think that over time, as people build up account balances, which most people will, because most people don't use a lot of health care, that may change the equation. The question being, do people look at large account balances and at some point use health care services that they wouldn't use if they didn't have the account, if they were only facing the deductible? So do account balances offset the effect of the deductible? Another question we want to ask is whether or not account balances affect choice of health plan. We can't answer that yet. And if anyone has data uh, to help me answer that, I'd, I'd welcome uh, the opportunity to do a study on it. But the thinking is, as people build up account balances, are they more likely to go to higher and higher deductibles? Uh, they may be, um, but it's something we can't, we can't look at at this point. So we know that account balances increase the longer you've had your account. If you look at accounts, this comes from the EBRI HSA database. Accounts opened in 2017 ended the year with a balance of just under $1,100. Accounts opened in 2007, 10 years earlier, ended 2017 with almost $8,400. Uh, so you don't want to just look at average account balances and what's happening over time, because there's so many new HSAs each year with low balances that that brings down the average. You want to look at these balances by how long people have had the accounts. And clearly, you know, the large balances may affect, may affect people's use of services over time. When they're, when they're looking at these dollars. So we set out to see whether or not this is in fact happening, whether or not uh, account balances, as people accumulate account balances, whether or not it increases use of services. We have a, there's information here about our data. I won't go over every bullet. But we've got a sample of about 5,800 people over four years uh, where we can match their health care claims to their account balances uh, and see what's going on there. What we find with this population, is that their balances are increasing. Uh, you could see that at the end of 2016, 
they had an people with employee only coverage had an average balance of just over 2,800, and people with family coverage had an average balance of over 3,300. What I find more interesting is that the percentage of accounts with a zero balance, percentage of accounts that have spent everything and ended 2016 with, with no money in them, is 2%. Okay, most people are rolling over money. Most people are building up an account balance, despite the fact that they're taking distributions and the average distribution is increasing each year. We're seeing these balances go up and, and more and more people, almost everyone in this sample, uh, with a balance after a few years. Now, uh, what we have found in general is that uh, the sample, the age, you know, since we're following a population over a number of years, uh, their average age is going up, and as you get older, you use more health care. So naturally, we're seeing an increase in, in use of health care services. Uh, what we want to do with our regression analyses is isolate the impact of the account balance from other factors, such as an aging population. And we have a number of outcomes we looked at. I'm going to skip over that and get right to the results. Uh, we looked at this a number of different ways. We have two models. And basically, the bottom line is we found that increasing account balances result in higher use of emergency department visits, higher use of outpatient office visits, both primary care physician visits and specialist visits. We did not find an impact related to inpatient services. We did not find an impact related to prescription drugs. Okay, so, you know, HSA balances are resulting in higher use of some services and some other services we looked at. Uh, mixed findings related to whether or not HSA balances increase the use of blood tests, uh, EKG, echocardiogram, and stress tests, uh, but across the board we find it increases the use of x-rays, CAT scans, mixed results relate to MRI, and chiropractic visits, and it increases physical therapy. So I think in some sense what we're finding is that increased balances increase the use of more discretionary services, uh, less expensive services, certainly not affecting inpatient services but they're affecting things that you may think twice about. Do I really need this x-ray? Do I really need an MRI? Maybe I should get an x-ray instead of an MRI. Uh, do I really need this blood work? Do I really need to go to physical therapy? Um, and that's where we're finding the most effects. So let me move on to the next study I want to talk about, the impact of deductibles on use of low-valued healthcare services. Note there's one word missing from this title that I want to point out. Anybody know what it is? The word high. Okay. This is not a study about high deductibles. It's a study about deductibles, both low deductibles and high deductibles, with the idea being that we want to know what happens after people reach their deductible. We did test our findings, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, by level of deductible and found no difference in behavior between people with low deductibles and high deductibles. So we combine them. It's easier to present that. But you know, we want to see is once you hit your deductible, your out-of-pocket spending drops. It may be a $10 or $20 or $50 copayment. It may be 10 or 20% coinsurance. But it's much lower than your deductible. So the question is, do people use more services when they reach their deductible? And are they using more low-valued services? And we'll talk about what a low-valued service is in just a minute. So some information about our sample uh, and the study. We don't, uh, as an economist, the last thing I want to do, one of the last things I want to do is decide what's a low-valued service. Um, we rely on the Choosing Wisely campaign to do that, which provides a comprehensive list. And I'll uh, give you an example of that in a minute. Uh, low-valued services are either harmful or of little clinical benefit. Uh, we're looking at five low-valued services plus cancer screenings, the five low-valued services being imaging for low back pain, within 60 days of onset, imaging for an uncomplicated headache within 60 days of onset, uh, pre-op testing for low-risk surgeries, and we use hernia repair as the example, uh, the pre-op testing being a combination of blood work and a chest x-ray. Uh, we also look at vitamin D testing and PSA testing, and we study the effect of reaching the deductible and the probability of using these low-valued services. Uh, the Choosing Wisely campaign, some background on that is an initiative the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation uh, aims to promote conversations be between clinicians and patients by helping patients choose care that is supported by evidence 
not duplicative, free from harm, and truly necessary. So this is really, it's, it's a campaign uh, between uh, providers and, and patients. Uh, and these are some of the recommendations just for low back pain. I'm not going to go through all five low-valued services here, uh, but just for this one, there, there are 12 recommendations related to low back pain. Uh, I've pulled out three here, one from the North American Spine Society, uh, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and the American College of Physicians, and they basically all agree on the same recommendation. Don't get imaging for low back pain within the first six weeks or so. Okay, that's their recommendation. Uh, there are other things you should be doing for low back pain within the first six weeks. And if low back pain extends beyond six weeks or so, then it may be time to get imaging done. Okay, and you see the same kind of recommendations from the other nine. You see the same kind of recommendations from the other low-valued services we're examining. And basically what we find is that once you reach your deductible, you're more likely to use these low-valued services. Okay, once you reach your deductible, uh, there's an 8% increase in the probability of getting imaging for low back pain within six weeks, 28% uh, increase within 120 days, 41% uh, increase in the likelihood of getting imaging for an uncomplicated headache within six weeks, 28% uh, increase in the likelihood of getting blood work done before getting your hernia repaired if you've hit your deductible, 73% increase in the probability of getting chest x-rays if you've hit your deductible and you're getting uh, hernia repair, uh, vitamin D testing 68% uh, higher uh, if you've hit your deductible, and PSA testing 21% higher. All, all of these are statistically significant to different degrees, uh, but across the board with these five. And it's not like we looked at other low-valued services and only picked out the ones where we found statistical significance. We always, you know, limited our analysis to just to just these five. Um, what I also find interesting is we did some work around cancer screenings, breast cancer, cervical cancer, and colorectal cancer screening, uh, because sometimes it's indicated and sometimes it's not, uh, and usually that depends upon the person's age. And and I'll just focus on the colorectal cancer screening uh, for people 50 and older. Once they've hit their deductible, they've got a 60% chance of, of uh, increase in the likelihood of getting uh, colorectal cancer screening at that point, despite the fact that for these people it's free, regardless of when they get it, if it's considered a preventive service. Uh, but maybe they don't know. Uh, maybe they think if there's some complication, that may cost them money, so let's wait till, they hit their, wait till I hit the deductible. Uh, whereas if you're under age 50, when it's generally not recommended at all. I think the recommendations may have gone down to age 45, but that wouldn't have affected the years of, of data we have. Uh, the likelihood of getting colorectal cancer screening jumps to 126% uh, if you've hit your deductible. Uh, so getting you know, services that are considered low value in, in a lot of cases at this age, not necessarily for everybody, you know, family history may play into the decision. Uh, but for some of these services, they're considered potentially harmful. Um, you know, imaging, even though you don't feel it, is an invasive surgery, invasive procedure. Um, so key takeaway here, reaching deductibles results in an increase in use of healthcare services that are unneeded, potentially harmful. Uh, keep in mind, what we're really trying to do here is look at, you know, as John started off by talking about, we want more beer uh, related to we want more healthcare, um, the unanticipated effects of plan design. Uh, you know, we think that uh, we've, you know, we may or may not have it right. I, I think here we're showing both in terms of high deductibles and deductibles in general that we may not have it right. You know, we may need some adjustments. Uh, employers are reacting different ways. You know, we need to engage people before they reach their deductible. We need to engage people after they reach their deductible. And that's what we're going to hear from uh, the next two speakers about. So thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, John, for that warm introduction. That was terrific. And a special thank you uh, for the Employee Benefits Research Institute for really providing this forum and allowing us to share our ideas and talk about our expertise. So I look forward to uh, listening to everyone else's presentations today. 
Um, so what I'm going to talk about um, at Comcast is how we are focused on transforming the employee experience. More specifically, how we are effectively managing the benefit costs of our plans by looking at, at that employee experience and making sure that employees have access to um, how they're engaging with and how they're utilizing their benefit programs. So we'll start with our vision. Uh, we feel that we can be successful when we can return employees back to their families healthy, if not healthier, than when they started working for us. Uh, contrary to a one-size-fits-all approach, we are, our vision is to really look at the way in which we're building a benefits platform and being able to provide an integrated solution uh, to our employees. Uh, we do feel that a seamless, integrated approach is really going to allow our employees and allow the system to really accelerate the ability to uh, provide information to our employees to allow them to make faster decisions and to drive better outcomes. So a little bit about us. Uh, at Comcast, we're big. Uh, we seem to be getting bigger each year. Uh, for several years now, our healthcare spend has been over a billion dollars a year. Uh, we cover over 220,000 plan participants, that's employees and their family members, and we are committed to delivering high-value health plans that have low co-pays, yes, low deductibles, uh, and low out-of-pocket maximums. And by high-value health plan, um, what I'll reference is the most popular plan that our employees enroll and almost 70% of our employees are enrolled in a plan that has an in-network actuarial value of 91%. So for every dollar of health care spend, Comcast is picking up on average about 91 cents on the dollar. Um, our employees obviously like our plans. Employee survey results show that 90% of our employees, actually 92%, uh, deem our plans favorable, if not highly favorable. And so we're really proud about that. So balancing quality and controlling costs can be sometimes easier said than done. Uh, we work hard to really manage our costs and we don't compromise on coverage. Um, we are really, really focused on making sure that we look at how we're spending money in the plans, how our employees are engaging with our plans. And um, if something isn't working, we pivot, we recenter, and reset. Uh, over the next several slides, I can share with you how we focus on eliminating waste, how we focused on reinvesting those dollars back into the system. I'll tell you a little bit about the team that's doing all this work at Comcast and tell you how we're measuring our success. And we also do a lot to help share the cost of healthcare benefits across the organization. One strategy that we do use at Comcast is if you're an employee and you receive a higher salary than some of our lower paid employees, you will be asked to pay higher premiums or higher employee contributions to participate in those same medical plans. And I think that too allows us to continue offering a rich benefit plans to our population that maybe other employers don't have the option to do. So putting aside plan design, uh, we'll talk about um, how we're also focusing on delivering this amazing employee experience. Um, we really want to provide and, and are focused on providing a very simple but single point of entry into our plans, um, access into our platform. Again, that seamless integrated approach is going to be very important to us with having all those support services then sending behind that single point of entry. Um, again, I do feel strongly that um, when you have a, a, a system that reacts to the customized needs of our employees, when it can do that effectively, that you really are going to have uh, the ability to have the plans uh, that support react faster to allow employees to make better decisions faster. So as we think about product development, um, we have a couple of things. Um, uh, we really want to make sure that our employees are using their plans as effectively as possible and that they're getting the most out of our plans. We want our employees to use their benefits. And we look at product strategy in a couple of different ways. Um, we actually partner with several of our strategic vendors to come up with solutions. I've noted to here uh, in the area of health assistance and financial assistance. Um, 
we've talked a lot about financial well-being earlier this morning, um, but with our health assistance, we're working with both of these partners to co-develop product, um, to be able to be a resource for our employees when they have questions, whether it's navigating the healthcare system or they have financial stress, uh, being able to reach out to these assistants and these assistants being able to provide guidance to them and product. And we don't know exactly what all those products look like, but we're working with these partners strategically to come up and build and co-develop these products together. And we're not afraid to take risks. If we know our employees have a need that can't be met in the marketplace by an existing product or existing service, we're fortunate enough to have the ability to build it. So we're working on that now, especially in the area of financial well-being. And we're not complacent. Um, we're not going to compromise on plan design, and we're not complacent with regards to where we are today. Um, we are constantly reevaluating and reassessing all of our plans, programs, our vendors, um, our strategic partners, just to make sure that we are extracting and really looking at any efficiencies that we can glean out of the programs. Again, continuing to deliver products that deliver value to our employees and help us manage costs effectively uh, is where our focus is. What is waste? Um, for us, it's very simply unnecessary health care spend. Um, that's really important to me and my team. Uh, we are tasked with identifying waste, eliminating it, and making strategic recommendations on how we are going to reinvest those dollars back into our programs to leadership. And how this shows up at Comcast is a very, very different ways. Um, uh, wrong diagnosis, wrong treatment, wrong provider at the wrong place. Um, a couple of examples. I actually was thinking of back surgeries this morning as one example, um, but that obviously comes into play. Um, the most uh, unfortunate thing is the number of unnecessary back surgeries that are being prescribed today. I think a lot of us are familiar with that. Um, but the lost opportunity for less to sit back and provide a less invasive approach, such as physical therapy, that to us is a missed opportunity. And unnecessary surgeries is on our waste initiatives uh, with something that we want to tackle. Um, or something even more egregious. Um, I came across a case the other day in which we had the spouse of one of our employees had his appendix removed um, because he was having significant uh, abdominal pain, had his appendix removed, and the surgeon came out of the surgery into the uh, uh, waiting room where the spouse was waiting and said, I removed the appendix, so everything's fine there, but you might want to get a colonoscopy, so I saw a little bit of infl in inflammation when I was in there. And sure enough, uh, the, the spouse went and got his colonoscopy, and a very simple procedure totally alleviated his abdominal pain. That test is waste. That was a significant uh, missed opportunity, not to mention taking the employee away from his family, away from work, um, and obviously recovery in that process. Um, so that's a great example, too, I think, of not only does waste cost the plan more, but without a day's doubt, waste is costing um, our patients more as well. So at Comcast, uh, we have a da data. We have a lot of data, and we look at that data. It's de-identified population uh, health management data, um, but that's where we get all of our ideas, and that's how we laser focus on opportunities within our plan. Um, we're fortunate enough on this team to have the insights, to have the intel, to have the processes, um, to be able to look at that data and reflect on areas of opportunities for us, um, and again, to make sure employees are getting the most out of their benefits. So it starts with awareness. Um, we do build strategic marketing campaigns out to our employees to make sure that they're getting and accessing the appropriate use of care. Uh, we also leverage prevention programs to slow the growth of communicable and chronic diseases. Um, to help lower costs even further, we use SHIELD programs to help augment plan design. Um, an example there would be expert second opinion services, um, especially if a diagnosis in, in surgery obviously is involved. And last but not least, uh, plan design and network optimization. Um, we look at those two things as an opportunity to really drive uh, exemplary care at the lowest possible unit costs. So plan design is important, not everything. Um, for sure, uh, we make a lot of plan design changes to help incentivize um, the ability to um, use labs as one example, I think, came up this morning. So we have zero dollar copays for preferred labs as one example. But we also use plan design to reinvest back into our programs. 
Uh, a few examples there. Last year, uh, we were laser focused on making sure that cost was not a barrier to behavioral health care. So there are no copays in our plan for in network behavioral health care unlimited. Um, and to tie to that, any psychotropic drugs that are tied to those behavioral health care visits, there's no copays for those either. Um, January 1st of this year, another reinvestment back into the plan was being able to lower our copays for certain chronic conditions that are being treated by hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes, which are three categories for us um, that we know there's an opportunity to continue to ensure that employees are taking their maintenance medications and their families. So we've eliminated those copays. So I think those are good examples of how we continually extract waste out of the system and reinvest it back into our plans. It takes grit. Uh, it takes a lot of grit to manage a billion dollar healthcare spend. And uh, we have spent a lot of time thinking about the resources and tools that we need as a leadership team uh, to help with that. So over the past couple of years, probably the last three years, we've developed this team we call TRIP. They are a TRIP. Uh, they're the Total Awards Innovation and Product Team. And this team is made up of a whole host of health plan experts. They focus on data and behavioral science. They focus on product design design, change acceleration, and employee research. Uh, this team really helps us as benefit leaders turn I our ideas into actionable um, solutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, in particular, um, this team helped us come up with all of our playbooks. So uh, this team has developed our playbooks, they continually manage our playbooks, but they manage our overall playbook portfolio. And for us, what a playbook is, is kind of a problem statement or an opportunity that we know needs to be addressed. Uh, based on data, uh, based on intel that we've learned and talking to our employees and listening to our employees, most importantly, we come up with playbook opportunities. Underneath each playbook, we identify initiatives or ways in which we can address that playbook. So my playbook, of course, one of them is waste elimination. Um, an opportunity or initiative under that is unnecessary surgeries. Emergency remutilization is another one. And there's all kinds of levers that we can pull, but having all of this in one place helps us as a leadership team make sure that we are laser focused on priorities and all of us have the same priorities. And so in our team, we don't have pet projects. Uh, we don't have projects that aren't tied to our playbooks. Everything that we do is tied to a playbook, and this TRIP team um, has really helped us make sure that we're focusing on the right priorities. So they've taken our playbook ideas uh, and opportunities and really turned them into uh, prioritized strategic action plans. Um, it, it really is true, and, and data is so much power for us, and we use data in a lot of ways. And it allows us to not only analyze data, but also look at where we are present state and have a vision about where it is that we want to be. Um, and we can do this through the playbook exercise. The TRIP team helps us. They even, if we want to build a new product or build a new service, they will actually partner with some of our strategic partners or vendors, and they'll go through workshops, like two-week sprint workshops in order to work through what that product or process needs to look like. So again, uh, a big value add uh, to our overall total rewards team. So as I've demonstrated today, um, we've come a long way. And, and I'm the first to admit we don't have all the answers um, by any stretch of the imagination. But we're working really hard. We're very passionate about the work that we do. And I will tell you one thing. Um, we have recognized that without a doubt, when you empower people, and the people for us are our employees who are helping to grow our business. With the assistance and the information they need to engage in their health and benefits, they are making vastly better decisions when it comes to their well-being. Um, better experiences really drives better outcomes, and our results have proved that. I'll, uh, I'll wrap here this morning uh, by sharing our mission. Um, this is our, our mission. We, um, we are not afraid to, to be disruptive, and we like to push against uh, status quo. Um, our team is very passionate, and we work really hard to effectively manage the cost of our plans. And one critical way in which we're doing this um, is by transforming that employee experience. <laughs> Um, there was an article written about how uh, we are reinventing healthcare at Comcast in the New York Times in August, and uh, I think she summed it up really well uh, in that article and said that we are shedding long-held practices and adopting a do-it-yourself approach. And without a doubt, I think that strategy is working really well for us at Comcast. So thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Brosky with Cigna Healthcare, and I'll be spending just a few minutes with you this morning. And before I start, I would like to uh, just give you a quick little background. I've been in this business since 1983. Uh, it's been a long journey for me, but I've really enjoyed it. I started uh, in the business where, at that time, what did we do in this industry? We delivered a service paying claims. It was pretty simple. How fast you paid them, and what was your quality like, and what network did you deliver to the marketplace at that time as we managed health care plans? Certainly a big change has occurred over the years uh, in my career as I've served uh, accounts in the range of 1,000 employees up to about 40,000 employees in my career. And one thing holds true, I know everybody here would probably agree with that, that uh, the fact is that employee benefits are here to help employers attract and retain employees. So I tried to remember that. It's like the first thing I learned in group school in 1983. And that as a backdrop really leads into my discussion about what you're going to hear from me is about what Sigma's doing. But of course, in the application of it, it really is unique to each individual customer that we serve. And over time, we've seen a transition from serving organizations to serving individuals, okay? From serving a provider, a plan sponsor, to delivering a service, an engaging service, to the customer. Customer being the individual. Big transitions occurred. So that's a little bit of a backdrop. So I'll start with a little bit about the environment we're in today. Talk a little bit about what we're doing as an approach uh, talk about some foundational elements that drive everything we do. Give you some practical matters about how that plays out. A little bit of a menu, so to speak, in terms of what we do in the marketplace. And then give you some results that I think uh, may be of interest to you to combine with some of the other information you've already gained. So a little bit about the environment. I don't know about you, but if I'm ever doing landscaping, it's good to understand the landscape before you dig, right? Make that phone call. Well, you'll see on these balloons here some of the key stats that we try to keep in mind. And these are just recent, I think, from the last couple of years. The few number of people that drive a lot of cost, 1%, 36% of cost. About 40% of people have a chronic condition. Especially drugs are taking a bigger and bigger bite out of total health care costs, and that's growing. And then from our standpoint, this whole concept of mind and body, the behavioral connection with health, is very, very important to what we do. 20% of the people have a behavioral condition. And those that have a behavioral condition with a health care condition spend two to three times more. And this has played out on all the accounts I serve. I just went through a series of reports for all my accounts, and that's basically a fact. So from our standpoint, we're looking at the whole person, the whole piece of risk. And we know that all of these things drive down to the bottom line of an employer. How's it going to affect their financials, their compensation? How are they going to attract and retain employees? So from our standpoint, a little bit about our approach. We put things all together in advocating for the whole person. Because we know that by doing so, we're going to be able to identify risk and handle it in a personal way like nobody else can. Because we're bringing all the resources together to do it. So some examples of that on this slide would include things like uh, predicting and saving. What does that have to do with? Well, that's all about analytics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but partnering and championing, no question, who are we partnering and championing with? Okay, Really, three people, three, three distinct audiences there. First being, our, of course, our plan sponsors, what their needs are, their unique circumstances and so forth, but also with the healthcare providers that we're working with. And that's been a dramatic change. Instead of us versus them, it's a we. So in fact, today, across our book of business, about 50% of our contracted providers are in an accountable care organization in our networks. That's a big change over the years. So we're partnering with them, and then we're championing the role of the customer in each individual and in what we do. So the end game, 
worse for us is to attract and retain clients, right, in our world. And we want to do that. We want to help employees find a balance in what they do, be more productive for their workforce, and do so in an economically feasible manner for our plan sponsors. So let's talk a little bit more about the how. Sorry, John, I got a problem here. Did I click something? Thank you, sir. Some of these themes that you've heard already today are going to flow through this section. So we didn't trade papers or anything, but it's very interesting to me. The backdrop really on what we do on connecting data starts at the highest level of the spectrum of health. Not just physical, you've already heard me talk a little bit about emotional, but social, financial, and environmental. Has it always been this way for Sigma? No, it has not. Actually, if I would have done this slide last year uh, or the year before, we would have talked about physical, emotional, and social. What it, why, why has it changed? Because we, we realize that these other elements have a measurable, the science is behind improving the whole experience of the individual. So our teams are aware, antenna are up, so to speak, in terms of all these factors to give us a view of the organizations we serve so we can deliver a better experience for their people. But more importantly, from, from our perspective, is really what's under the hood. You know, what's under the hood? Well, we have an engine with powerful analytics. Now, I know our competitors do. They say theirs is good. I say ours is better. Uh, and I think particularly because we take an approach to bring in all the elements impacting those we serve. <coughs> Behavioral, pharmacy, medical, health risk, and so forth to deliver a better outcome. But more importantly, we do it in such a way that goes beyond simple connectivity. Anybody can bring a lot of data together. The real question is, what do you do with it and how does it make an impact? And for us, really, data is the fuel that drives interactions, interactions with those we serve. So think of the constituents, customer, the individual, the provider, and the plan sponsor. Those interactions that we make with those constituents across all these dimensions, regardless of plan design, okay, so we're not saying, only plans with high deductibles, we're going to handle it this way. Those that have a copay, rich, a richer plan, a high value plan, uh, we're going to handle it this way. So we're agnostic to plan design because we know all these elements matter. The deployment is really pro probably the bigger question. So from our standpoint, these level of interactions with real-time data will make an impact in how people use the system, how they interact in preventive care, how they interact with us in chronic coaching, for example, how they use in-network services, how we reduce waste. All those types of things come into play. And I think the reason, I guess the secret sauce from the Sigma standpoint, I would say, gets down to engagement. Because as I've mentioned, we've gone from really delivering a service I've been with the company 19 years. So even when I started with Cigna, it was paying claims. I heard things like, we're a big company. We can pay claims really well. We've got great networks across the country. We were known as not being really flexible and so forth. But in the last few years, really over the last five, we've changed our viewpoint to deliver a better experience. Why does that matter? Delivering a better experience is going to Oh, I mean experience for the customer, right? Because when it all comes down to it, I'll retain clients, large employers, public entities, and so forth because of trend management, but also because of how their employees feel about their experience with Cigna. Okay, so delivering on that experience. And engaging people is a process over time. I mean, I love my wife. But she didn't, if I would have proposed the first date, she probably would not have said yes. <laughs> I fell asleep on the first date. 
she had to know me, get to know me, and to understand me. And I think the same, that's a simple example, but the reality is, in our business, the same holds true. We have to help people understand the value we can bring, and we do that through delivering uh, services across the spectrum of the, some things you'll see on the left side they'll spend a couple minutes on. Good example would be, of course, evidence-based medicine and things like that. Uh, and some changes we've made, uh, we've expanded our evidence-based programs. We're not taking our foot off the pedal, we're doing more. Why? Because there's more data to help support what we do. We're trying to do it better in our interactions with people. Uh, we're always uh, using analytics to find them sooner. And I always use the analogy of a, a metaphor of a net, you know, to find the health risks that we need to deal with. Of course, in the last couple of years, we've expanded to, to build a wider net with finer mesh. And by doing so, we're de delivering more clinical resources earlier to people. Because as we know, with 100% uh, on preventive, everybody gets a preventive exam. Is that right? Everybody gets one. No, stats, even on my largest clients, it's probably 30%, some maybe up to 40%. So that way 60 that we don't know about the risk. So from our viewpoint, trying to find a way to get more information to help individuals. But I think one of the biggest developments we've had, and I'll skip down to this one a little bit, and then I'll come back, is um, you'll see a note about data-driven platform. We developed a product over the last few years called OneGuide, and it's really a reflection of some insights we gained from national accounts. And why that's important is that we changed the service model to an engagement platform. That not only, it's not a, you ask the question, you get the answer model, to using analytics at the forefront of the experience. So whether it be on the digital asset or the phone, when that call comes in, the participant will be prompted to their five top next best healthcare actions. For example, have you thought about, or did you know that you have a prescription that hasn't been refilled? Or did you know that you're eligible for an incentive that will give you $500? Or did you know that there's opportunities for you to use in-network services the next time you seek care? All of that same experience is built on the super analytics that drive also to the, uh, the site. So results on that, we get more coaching, we get more preventive care, and so forth. And on the right side, you'll see the impact that we're seeing on our, our most recent platform on uh, health management, which is certainly uh, something you can't, it uh, uh, gives a huge background and a payoff. Oh, I went too fast on that. Did you move that, John? Uh, I want to touch on this one because this is an important slide. We did some study, and this will be in your, your information, about the relationship of my signal, that's our data set, on high deductible health plans. So just by having a high deductible health plan and the promotion we do, we're gonna get more people registered, more logins, more views, meaning getting them to the resources that can help them. So in our view, across our business, if we can build a relationship as early as possible, we're setting the stage for better experience, for more plan efficiency, reduce waste, and better trend management. And we've kind of proven that over the years and what we've done. And then in the end, from Sigma's standpoint, by putting it all together, I mean all together, behavioral, pharmacy, and medical, our results are showing, this is a study that we did, I think we released it last year, for clients that have it all together with us, not all do, not all of our, all of our clients do, but we're seeing about a $200 per member per year savings on those clients compared to those that don't have integrated pharmacy and behavioral. And it's all because of the experience, driven by the data, bringing those interactions, and building an experience for people to engage, make the right decisions, you know, make it easy for them to do the right thing. And for us, as a company, it's had a real payoff in terms of what we're doing, in terms of reported Wall Street trend. And uh, we're not satisfied. We know that our acquisition of ESI that occurred last year uh, will help further our results for the future. So I thank you for your time, and I look forward to the panel discussion. I want to invite you to the microphones if you've got questions for this panel. If you don't, I've got several that I can can start with. Any questions? Yes, Shan, if you would come to the microphone, please.
Hi. Great information, Shan Fowler. Um, I, uh, I've had the privilege of working on the uh, partner or vendor side, uh, sitting across the table from the Comcast team, yourself and um, uh, Sean and, and the rest of the, the great team. It's, it's a brilliant approach that you have. And I have kind of a three-part question for, for both of you. Um, the, the, the approach, as I, as I recall it and as you've explained it, is, is really fantastic because it's, it can be kind of a, uh, a high touch in the beginning approach and a very sort of assisted approach, as you showed. Um, and the, you know, as you said, the plan designs don't matter a whole lot um, because you're getting that touch and you're getting people to, to get in there. Um, that can really you know, terrify a lot of uh, employers because they hear something like high touch, especially a CFO here something like high touch and they think high cost. Um, but I'd love to hear you talk about a little bit about how it's actually, you know, the opposite. Um, and then along with that, that kind of approach requires that you have, as you've said, really good partners. Um, and these, this is a business where partnerships don't always work very well together. So I'd love to hear, like, who are your willing partners? Are your, you know, are carriers, you know, very, you know, are they um, open to this? Are, you know, other people open to this? And then finally, just, uh, uh, you know, obviously you said you have some ventures and you can do, um, uh, you can kind of release this to the world. Obviously, Haven Health and the whole Amazon, JP Morgan thing, um, are there plans to kind of release this to the world? Because there are a lot of companies out there that, uh, not only don't spend a billion dollars, but don't have you know the money that they're spending already on this, and could really use some solutions. Okay, um, I'll start, and then I'll let okay. you, Jim, chime in. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, you know, uh, the question's plural. I think that we feel very strongly. You mentioned about um, allowing employees uh, to make it easy for them to make the right choices. And we also want to say to make it hard to make the wrong choices. So if we can build a system that can react to what the employee's needs are, some employees are not going to want to have a conversation, whereas other employees are going to want to interact digitally um, in order to get that information. So it's important for us to try to build an integrated, holistic solution that responds to what employees want and when they want it. Um, everybody's going to be different. We're trying to build a customized solution. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. And I can tell you one example. Um, uh, an interaction uh, with one of our healthcare concierges can go something like having a phone call and having a conversation about um, can you find me the best provider for this service or it can be uh, the same outcome of that conversation can happen on the mobile app. Um, uh, when somebody is looking for a provider, uh, even on the other end of that mobile app, they will make the recommendation, oh, you're looking for the nearest urgent care center, are you not feeling well today? To really drive down, is it you or maybe a dependent that you're asking about? Once they find out if it's you, they'll answer your question and say, did you know you have a lower cost option by going to a minute clinic, as one example, as opposed to the urgent care center? Um, and it kind of walks you through the process just as if you were having a conversation on the telephone. And again, we're trying to build a solution that the outcome is going to be the same regardless of how employees interact with the system. Um, so I'll let you chime in too. Uh, just a couple of things I would add. I think the thoughts that hit me really come down to uh, reducing barriers for people as early as possible, finding the way that's going to work for them best. A good example could be uh, some clients that we've worked with have uh, started local, uh, their own clinics that we partner with. We've had clients that may bring in a specialized vendor. It could be for something for in vitro uh, services. It could be for second surgical opinion. Whatever it may be that a client's trying to bring to the table to help, you know, that trigger point uh, in all aspects of their plan, I think you're going to get a better outcome and it even uh, ties to some pre-diabetic program. So, uh, the thought, the, the other thing that occurred to me is that, you know, you mentioned I was a fly fisherman, you got to keep casting. So we got to, but we got to use good information to target what we're doing. And I think you get a better payoff by doing that and trying new things. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Josh Cotton, Brookings. Paul, your work, which is clearly very interesting, I had two questions about it. One is you pointed out the fact that the deductible affects people's use of, think of them as low value added activities. And so one question is obviously, does it 
also affect their use of high value added activities and does it turn out that people are smart enough to know the difference between high value added and low value added activities or does it basically just discourage use of theirs? The second question is you're obviously arguing for the possibility of a conversion to a more reliant on copay model than deductible model and have you thought through the implications of that, et cetera? Yeah, so okay. for your first question, you. Um, you know, we, as I mentioned, we've done a lot of research. Others have done research on the impact that deductibles have. And so, for example, one of the things we found was that uh, when you move a population with diabetes to a high deductible health plan, they reduce their medication adherence. They're less likely to take the medications that they should be taking. And no employer wants to see something like that. And there are other examples like that. So it does affect use of services that, that are considered high value services. Uh, on your question about you know, have I given thought to alternative plan designs, I have. I think about that a lot. I think about whether or not deductibles are the right plan design. Should we even have deductibles? And when I question that, I'm not questioning whether or not we should have cost sharing. You know, I'm questioning what's the right level of cost sharing. What should it look like? And it, and it might look something like, uh, and I'm not advocating for this, I just think this is a conversation we need to have. Maybe 50% coinsurance is, is the right answer. I don't know what the right answer is. Um, but I think we need to start thinking outside the box. I like reference pricing uh, because it not just engages the participant, it engages the providers as well. Uh, it's not perfect uh, because you will, when you set a reference price, you may see low price providers come up in price. Mm -hmm. So there are some issues there. Uh, but I think we need to start looking at examples okay. like that. You know, you, you heard a lot. You know, if you think about why we're on the verge of 50% of people in high deductible health plans, it's <clears> the easiest thing to do. Right? All you're doing is changing one number. Uh, you're not doing all the things that they talked about in addition to that. You don't have to. Maybe you should, but I think, you know, we need to start looking at, you know, put, putting everything on the table uh, to really figure out what works, what, you know, what's the right incentives at the right time. Um, you know, and I think the issue with deductibles, it's a one-size-fits-all plan design. That may not work right for everybody in that situation. Thank you, Paul. Hi, I'm Sandy McKenzie. I'm these days I'm an economic consultant, and Josh may have stolen my, my thunder. And Paul, I may have misunderstood your uh, beginning of your presentation because I actually was outside the. I, I'm sorry. Um, I'm Sandy McKenzie. Uh, I'm these days I'm an economic consultant, semi-retired. Uh, Josh may have stolen my thunder, uh, uh, but I wanted to ask Paul a question. I mean. You know, you, you charge people more for something, they're going to demand less of it, basically, at a very simple level. And there, you know, it may be that copays are better than, than higher deductibles and so forth. But are people always aware when something's low value and something's high value? Do they have the, the knowledge to be able to distinguish between the two? Um, the second point I'd make, and I hope it isn't just overly personal, but when it comes to colorectal cancer, my paternal grandfather died of it at age 58, uh, uh, 10 years uh, plus uh, younger than I am. My father came down with it, and now my uh, niece, my oldest brother's child, has come down with it. I'm rather big on colorectal cancer screen screening, uh, regardless exactly of how it's paid for. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll address that comment first, uh, because in, in the guidelines, even though there are age uh, appropriate guidelines, exceptions are made for things like family history. Family history. Um, and, and that's why I think our findings are not necessarily perfect uh, because they're not picking up, you know, specific circumstances where it is uh, appropriate to get screenings outside of the age recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something, you know, that, that's not easy to pick up in claims data. Um, on, your, on your comment about knowledge between uh, what's low value and what's high value. Um, you, you know, we're not really distinguishing, you know, we're not really focusing on patient knowledge as much as the financial incentives and how that affects the use of services. So, you know, I don't know if, if I need a hernia repair, I don't know if I'm going to ask the doctor whether or not 
I need to serve whether or not I need a chest, chest x-ray in advance but I think I would you know my, my response may be different depending upon how much it's going to cost me whether it's a low value service or high value service and, that, and that's one of the issues with deductibles being a one-size-fits-all uh, it affects both low value services and high value services okay, thanks. Ben Morris with UMB Bank uh, and thank you for the, the panel's information wondering if you can anyone can connect the dots between the first panel and the second panel as far as what we're doing for help retirement as well as then what we're doing with the health care side thank you I'll take a stab at that um, you know I was really listening uh, to several things I resonated with what Amy was saying about the ability to empower employee make sure that employees have information that they need in order to make the right choices um, uh, I think both of us have a passion towards making sure that if an employee is in a situation where they are worried about money, that is their number one concern, um, that's exactly why we're building a new resource around <coughs> financial assistance um, to help tackle financial stress. Um, we all know, I, I believe it was referenced earlier too, what financial stress um, can do on your productivity, on your claims costs. Um, uh, so I think we are connecting the dots there, and I think Amy and I share a similar feeling that uh, you need to be able to provide information to employees um, uh, as quickly as possible and as easily as possible. And just to add, uh, digital advice, that's what I heard Amy say. Uh, totally agree with that, and that's evolving. As we get more information, we find different ways to uh, deliver it in a way that's going to, I guess, get us the right outcome give them the right choices, an informed choice, right? Um, and then I think Bob mentioned something about we don't, uh, you don't put people into buckets, right? They don't break them in, uh, their life into buckets, and we don't either. It's where they're at today. They may call us about a concern on a behavioral issue with a dependent child. That's not the time for us to say, we have coaching, you can get $500 incentive. No, the, we want to help them with where they're at right now because we earned the right maybe to get to that next step to help them along their way. So, that's what I would say. And I, I would just add, and I'm getting the, the hook, do, do we have time for just one more, maybe? But I just, be, just before that, I'm just briefly, the HSA is a terrific vehicle to help people for that type of savings long term, because so much of our later in life expenses are health care. What a better product to help people get into and to accumulate money but a health savings account. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Stuart Hagen with the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. I had a question for Sabrina. Um, so uh, impressed with the program that you have at Comcast, and I was wondering if uh, how much that is, do you think, specific to Comcast, or if you were to go to another company of similar size, would you end up implementing a similar program? How much of this is based on the, sp the specific characteristics of Comcast? And then I had another follow-up question. Um, no, that's a great question. I think that um, over the last five years, um, we have walked into an organization and looked at all these opportunities. It's a very diverse group of employees. We've got Comcast on the one hand, NBC Universal on the other. Um, now we've just acquired Sky. So we have a very different set of employee populations that we're trying to solve for. Um, over the last five years, our trend, if you take out all of our reinvestments, has been 1.35%. And I think that's because we started um, with the low-hanging fruit. We started with the easy stuff. It's getting harder. This, this is not for the faint of heart. Um, and I think that, again, it's looking at data. And the more that we can build up this internal team that has the expertise to help us mine that data and look for opportunities, um, the better positions that we're going to be able to react to what that data is telling us to be able to build services, plan design, or tools um, in order to solve for any of those opportunities and those gaps. Okay. And actually, you answered my second question, which was about trends. So that's good. Thank you. Could you warmly thank the panel? Thank you, everyone. We'll see you back at 11.15.